When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Poor Thomas. Thomas gets slammed the second Sunday of Easter every year. Thomas is accused of doubting the resurrection, doubting that it ever happened. He's accused of demanding proof that Jesus did come alive again. But friends, is that really what Thomas was doing? Yeah, it's clear that Thomas had his questions about this resurrection thing. Thomas wondered what it means, but don't we all? Isn't that part of the questioning of faith? When things come to us that are bigger than what we can even wrap our minds around? You see, the resurrection, when we stop long enough, really doesn't make rational sense. I mean, we don't see this kind of life overcoming death stuff very often, if ever, before now. So isn't it natural? Isn't it natural for Thomas and all of us to have questions about something that really betrays, or should we say goes beyond a rational, logical way of thinking? Thomas, I think I get you. You're simply asking honest questions. You see, I wonder if Thomas isn't just daring enough to put words to his grief. And the words to his grief may sound at times like doubt. But isn't that the cry of the heart broken in the death of a loved one for all of us? Yeah, Thomas may be expressing some doubts, but he may be expressing a grief in a way in which that we understand those of us who have lost loved ones recently. When we have that same kind of a plea, I just want to see this loved one one more time, just as they were. Now let's remember that Thomas wasn't with Mary at the tomb when Jesus appeared to her. Thomas was not there earlier in the morning when Jesus appeared to his disciples. And so, Thomas, was he really demanding proof that the resurrection really happened or not? Or was he simply saying, I want to see my Lord. I want to see my beloved friend also one more time. In his deep grief, he was willing to put it into words. 
and sometimes they sound like doubt. Friends, the good news of Easter, the good news of the days that follow Easter is that Thomas did see Jesus again, and so will we in our day. Yes, it was the same Jesus. They had the wounds of the resurrection in his hands and his side. And even when Jesus presented himself to Thomas, it wasn't necessary for Thomas to touch him. It was clear. It was indeed the one that he loved, the one that he longed to see, the conquered Lord of death and life. Glimpses of Jesus. Where do we get our glimpse of Jesus, the resurrected Lord? Pastor Steve Garner's Holmes writes it this way. You want to see real resurrection? Not its paperwork. You want to touch it. You know where to look. Ignore the packaged and trimmed doctrine. Don't even look at your slick success stories. Look in your wounds. Reach out and put your hand in your losses. The mark of your shame, where is it empty? Where does your failure flop out of its costume and bleed all over the floor? Go ahead, touch it. Put your hand on your inadequacy. The deepest wounds go deeper than you. Sit a while with the corpse of yourself. Wait there. Wait. Wait for what you can't wait for, you can't ask for. Let the great emptiness open up in you. And let it be as vast as God, the wound divine, your anguish and your beloved one. There, where there's hopeless, there's where hope is. Go there. Listen for the voice. When we read the story of Mother Teresa, we'd have to say she got that message. She saw Jesus in the eyes of the wounded. She saw the risen Christ in the wound and then the, the frowns and the groans of the hungry and the dying in the streets of Calcutta. Friends, we also catch glimpses of Jesus, the resurrected Lord, in the wounds that we bear too. There's where Jesus shows himself. We see Jesus in the wounds of our friends who are deep in grief. We see Jesus in the wounds of the world. We see Jesus, the risen one, in the grieving wounds, deep grieving wounds in Sri Lanka. And over the weekend, we see Jesus even weeping with a synagogue in California you see, we catch glimpses of Jesus in the desperate wounds of refugees who are flying, fleeing oppression and the threat of violence where people are so harsh to their own people. Today, today we're saying farewell and thank you to Cindy DeMonaco. For 27 years, Cindy has worked in our church and later years as the operations administrator. Cindy has supervised the support staff with tender care and encouragement and wise judgment. She has overseen the physical plant of this church with its many, many, many repairs. But you know, Cindy, that's not the mark that you're going to leave with us. It's the way in which that you've helped us to see Jesus in the lives of the wounded. You've helped us see Jesus in the lives of those who stop by your office for help or for a listening ear. I wonder, I wonder how many people who have stopped by our Savior's Lutheran to get some financial assistance for gas or groceries and they left with much more than a plastic credit card or two. I wonder how many of us have called into the church office with a prayer concern and we got Cindy on the other side of the phone and she has listened and after recording our request has spoken the word of care and encouragement to us in Jesus' name. I wonder, 
I wonder how many of us have stopped by church to talk with somebody about a family concern. And Cindy was never too busy to talk with us. You see, in the life and faithful ministry of Cindy Delmonico, this congregation and this community have seen what it means to reach out to people at their point of need. We might say in their wounds. And there this faithful servant has exhibited the risen Christ who has touched our wounds with his resurrection life. Cindy, if we say that we're going to miss you is such an understatement, I can't say it. Your unlimited, unlimited dedication to this church and its ministry, your sincere care, your penchant for leggings and high heels in all weather conditions, your humor, your gift of hospitality and the innate ability you have to always appear with a snack or a cup of coffee for those of us who are in waiting or even a large meal for a large new member class. Cindy, you have served this communion, the communion, this community with the love of Jesus. You have met Jesus and we have met Jesus, the risen Christ at the points of our woundedness in you. That is precisely what Thomas was looking for. You have enfleshed Jesus, the risen Christ, and in you, we have seen Jesus, the risen one, and for you, we give thanks to God. Amen.